by the grace of God, and we need to be about what God has called us to. Shamgar was one of those guys, you know. Instead of whining about what he's losing, he's broken over what everybody else is losing. Last week we dealt with against all odds in regard to uh, David at Ziklag. Remember, he's absolutely defeated. He's, he's been running from God. He's backslidden. He's gone into the enemy's lands, made friendships with the Philistines. They're still rejecting him. It's one rejection after another, one defeat after another. Finally gets to the point he gets back to this camp he had when the Philistines rejected him. And the Amalekites from the south had come up and taken everything he owned. And he's completely, in fact, all his men are weeping and broken. They've lost everything. I mean, there's really no hope. There's no hope of recovery, no hope of restoration. They've lost it all. And it says that when David's men spoke of stoning him, that David turned to the Lord and asked God what to do. Sometimes we get ourselves like David in situations of discouragement and despair and defeat. And we just say, well, what's the use? I'm, I'm just tired. I failed, whatever. And we, you know, you just, what's, what's the use? David sought the Lord. and David humbled himself before the Lord. And he got a promise from the Lord. And the Lord said, go re- pursue the Amalekites and restore everything you've lost. Now, that restoring all is important because I think it goes further than just some material things. And so it was, it was a victorious moment against all odds. And it was not long after that that David was made the king over Israel. Today, I want to look at another element of against all odds. This is a unique story, not a real lengthy passage either in, in, the, in the book of uh, 2 Kings chapter 6. In 2 Kings chapter 6, it's a story about Elisha. Not Elijah, but Elisha. And Elisha comes on the scene and God's using him as a prophet throughout the land. And as he's there, there's some difficult things that are happening. Now, one thing about being a prophet at that particular time, there was really no prophet in it, all right, like some of our prophets today. He's suffering along with the people, but God, in the context of all the problems, God's still meeting his needs, as he promised to do. But this not, Elisha's not backing off. I mean, when trouble comes, I mean, that's just, that's, that's, that's a dare, all right? He just steps up and continues to be what the Lord wants him to be. In fact, as the enemies of God's people are plotting and planning against the people of God, Elisha's got an open connection to a kind of inside covert information in the, in the spy intelligence arena. He's not in the land where the enemies are. God's just telling him what's going on. And when God tells him what the kings of Aram and others are doing, he just tells the king of Israel and tells the Samaritan king what's getting ready to come down and warns them about the the, 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 the plans and the, and the uh, I can't think of the word I'm thinking of, but it'll come to me tomorrow. But the, the idea is that the enemy is, is moving towards and their, their mechanism for war. He warns them. And the king, Aram, in this context, is uh, he, he's getting ticked off. He thinks that somebody is in his circle who's, who's a spy and who's telling everything that he's saying. So he gets everybody together and says, all right, this is it. I want to know who's telling the king of Israel what's going on. Finally, one servant who apparently had a little covert information of his own steps up and says, well, uh, sir, it's, it's like this. There's a prophet in the land of Israel by the name of Elisha. We need to take care of him. We'll take care of our problems. Because what he's doing, whatever you're saying in the privacy of your bedroom, whatever your covert plans have been, he just tells the king of Israel. Aren't you glad you hadn't got a pastor that can hear in the privacy of your bedroom? Amen. <laughs> He's telling the king of Israel what's going on. And, and then, then he just warns them. And so you're always being defeated. It's not that you have a spy here. It's that, you know, this guy's getting inside information. And so the king is severely upset about this. And he said, well, let's take care of that. Let's go get Elijah. And the story picks up at this point in, in, in chapter 6 of 2 Kings, around verse 15. Uh, It starts like this. Now, when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots were circling the city. And Elijah's servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw and behold, the mountain uh, was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And he saw they that with us are more than they that be against us. Now, this is a great, great passage. And sometimes we have trouble relating to it because we don't necessarily see the spiritual arena as Elisha, perhaps we think, was able to see it. 
And as when he prayed, opened the servant's eyes to Elisha. But l- let me give you a little, little, I think, a valuable tidbit that will help you in this regard. Because when we talk about s- spiritual perception this morning in the midst of against all odds situations... I I believe that Elijah, as a prophet of God, was familiar with the Word of God as it was revealed. And they had the five books of Moses and lots of the Psalms and some of the Proverbs in his time, all right? They had been written. And I believe that the man of God was familiar with the Word of God. And his perception and his statements and his insight were based upon what does the Bible say? So that when he came against certain scenarios in his life, he knew what the Bible said. You say, where do I get physical, I mean, uh, this visual, uh, spiritual perception from? I believe it comes from familiarizing yourself with what does the Bible say. And so that you can no longer, you're not looking at things in situations with physical eyes. You're looking at them with your spiritual eyes. And the focus of the spiritual eyes is what does God say about the situation? That's my sight. The word of God is what I choose to believe. That's that's where Paul said we don't walk by by sight. We walk by faith. What's the basis of our faith? The word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So my perception of things is based on just how well do I know the Word of God. If I am ignorant concerning the Bible, I'm ignorant about everything going on around me. I I mean it, folks. If I'm ignorant, if you're sitting here today and you're kind of, uh, you know, still in first grade or kindergarten in regard to Scripture, you you know, you're going to live a confused life. And it's going to be a difficult time and you're going to be those people in life who wrings their hands a lot who perhaps worries about, who's always kind of in that negative, pessimistic mode, it's not going to work out, it never does, I don't think it's going to be better than this. You're going to be like this servant of Elijah when he wakes up. You can almost see the guy, you know, got to get my morning coffee. He walks out on the balcony and he sees now that the enemies are surrounding the city and it says they're riding circles in their, their army marching around the city. And his first reaction is, alas! And he runs in, obviously, and wakes up the prophet. Wake up, we're doomed, it's over, there's no hope. We're surrounded, they're gonna kill us now. I told you not to tell what's going on with the king's life. That's his, that's his, that's his attitude, it's despair, it's, it's discouraging and you know, he doesn't see what's going on. And that's where we live our lives as Christians when we really don't comprehend what's really going on around us. Catch this passage where Paul wrote the church of Corinthians. He said, it said in chapter four, he said, listen, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporal and the things which are not seen are eternal. He said, what? How can I look at things that I can't see? He tells you very clearly, you can see physical things with physical eyes. But if you want to see eternal things, you have to look with eternal eyes. And where do eternal eyes go? Eternal eyes turn to what the Bible says because the Bible is what it is, all right? What the Bible says is what the truth is. You say, how can you believe that? Because 5,000 plus years of recorded history and prophecy have proven that the Bible's right over and over again. So I can put my trust and I can put my faith in thus saith the Lord. So what am I going to focus on? I'm going to focus on the things that are the Word of God, that are written in the Word of God, of what God says about the scenario and what God says about the situation. That's not where we're at in most people's lives. What we have to deal today with is a spiritual blindness and that keeps people from, from looking. Not that we don't see physically. Not that we don't see the problems or the situation or the scenario that's happening around us. We see that clearly. But we're not seeing the other thing. Now what most Christians do, they have two methods here. One is what I would call the uh, Jonah method. I'm just going to, I know what God says, I just want to deal with it. I don't deal with it. I'm just, I, I can't deal with that. It's too big for me. I can't do that. It's too hard for me. And you just, you don't want to do it. And so you just keep running from God. I want you to know there's a well for every one of us. You keep running. Pretty soon, all your buddies are going to throw you out of the boat. And you're going to be left to the belly of the well. Mark it down. Well, it hadn't happened yet. Hey, that's because you ain't got eyes to see the fish coming. But the Bible says the fish has found you out. And you're like stink baked to a catfish. <laughs> He's going to get you. Otherwise, you need to turn around and see the truth of what's going on. Now, the second scenario we have is what I call the ostrich method. We just stick our head in the sand. I don't want to think about it. I got problems at home. I don't want to think about it. I got problems at the job. I don't want to think about it. I got problems at I don't want to think about it. 
That's, that's the world we live in. We, well, I, I don't want to think about it, so I'll get high. I don't want to think about it, so I'll take the pills. I don't want to think about it, so, I, so I'll, I'll get stoned. I'll get drunk. I, I don't want to think about it, so I'll get preoccupied with something else. It's the same idea. That I don't know what the hole you're sticking your head in. There's all kinds of holes, all right? And you live your life that way, and you live in blindness, and you don't see what's really going on around you. The servant said, oh, Lord, we're surrounded. They're going to kill us now. And, and, and Elisha said, Lord, I pray that you would simply open his eyes. Why do we pray to have our eyes open? Ultimately, every one of us, without exception, are governed by what we see. We make decisions on the basis of what we're seeing. It looks this way, then I'll do this. If it looks that way, I'll do this. And so what we need is real perception. To see things, as the apostle said, uh, not necessarily what's seen, but what is not seen. You've heard me say it and reiterate it a thousand times here. Well, I don't like the statement, it is what it is. You know? Because that only holds true in one place. When you're looking at things that are unseen, that is what it is. And that can be counted on, and that can be banked on, and that can be lived by. What does, by, what does the Bible say? What does God say? Or I can live by, well, just, that's just the way it is. Look, that, I see physically with my physical eyes. That's, that's what truth is. That's, no, it isn't truth. That's, that's, and, and Paul says it very clearly why it's not truth. It's not truth because it's not eternal. And what's eternal is what's true. What's temporal is not true. I mean, let's, let's get a little uh, philosophical here for a moment. This building's not true. Why not? It's going to fall down, rot deteriorate, be bulldozed. It's just not going to last forever. It's just not. But what is true? There's another building that meets in this building that's true. Amen. You, me, the children of God. That's true. We're going to live forever. So, so I, I need to understand that. But it's the same thing about life. There's a lot of things that, you know, they're valuable, important things in our life, but they're not necessarily the truth. And if we really want to have a life that's not filled with doubts and fears and frustrations and worries, you know, and stresses of all kinds, we need to learn to look at things that are not seen. What is God doing? What is God saying? It may look like we're up against all odds. There's no way. It's a no-win scenario until we look at see what the Lord's up to and we find out what God's doing in our situation. And if we get our eyes open, well, guess what? I think we're in for, for a big surprise. I think that blindness, especially in the life of people who don't know the Lord and some people who do know the Lord, comes in for, on, in about four levels. I, let me give you four things that will cause blindness in your life. I think one thing that causes blindness in our life is just, it's, it's dead religion, all right? That's where I think the Lord's talking to the church in Laodicea and he says, hey, you're just doing all this stuff, but you've got no heart in it, you don't love me. He says, you say you're rich, you're increased with goods, you have need of nothing, you don't know you're wretched. You see one thing, but the truth is something else. Your heart's not right. You're miserable. You're spiritually poor. You're spiritually blind and bankrupt. You're spiritually naked. But you say, if you read that passage, they said all these other, just the opposite. And God said, I'm seeing the truth about you guys. You're not right with me. Your heart's not right with me. You're just going through the motions. And what happens when we start going through the motions and leave off the important part of why we're saved Step one is to know God, to walk with God, to fellowship with God. If my relationship and my fellowship are not Moving forward, and we're not growing, and I'm not going with God, walking with God today, guess what? I've entered into the realm of dead religion, and as a result of it, I'm blind as a bat. Just blind. I think I know what's going on. I have no idea what's going on. I think I got a grip. I don't have a grip on what's going on. I'm blind. Why? Because deception has come in, and I'm deceived. Another thing that causes a blindness in our, in our spiritual walk in life, it goes beyond just the dead religion. It gets to the point where, you know, Satan just blinds us. Sin blinds us. We let something into our heart that we're not right with God on, and we just, we, we're deceived by it. Paul said, sin, taken occasion by commandment, deceived me, and, and, and by it, I was, it slew me. Sin is, is, is the very thing as a Christian that if I choose to embrace and I choose to say, I'm just, I know what God says, but I don't, yeah, well, I don't, I don't care, but I'm, just, I'm not going to pay attention to it. I'm going to do what I want to do. Guess what? You're going to be slain and you're going to be blind. The same context deals when not only is it, is it really sin that deceives us, but ultimately Satan's getting in the mix of things and he's deceiving us. Now, in, in, the, in the passage here in, in 2 Corinthians 4, it's talking about somebody who doesn't know Jesus at all when he says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. In other words, before you meet Christ, this is the way it is. 
You think you know what's going on, but you don't. You think you know what God's talking about, but you don't. You think you know what the cross is about, but you really don't. You think you understand eternal things, but you don't. You think you un you're just blind. And what happens, all you're seeing is yourself, what you want, what your desires are, what your world is. This is it's like these, just, just right here, that's it. But when Jesus shines his light on you, all right, and this little crumbling wall begins to deteriorate, you begin to see the big picture. You begin to see there is a God and he does care about you. You begin to understand that the word of God is from God and it's a living book. You begin to understand things you had not understood before. You begin to perceive things. Boy, you read through 1 John when he talks about hereby we know that we are the children of God because. Boy, about five or six of those statements in 1 John. One of them says, we know we're of God, little children, because we now see that the world lies in darkness. So we now see what sin's about. We need to see how Satan deceived us. We begin to see what the truth of God's about. We get a, a glimpse in the spiritual realm when our eyes get open. But I want you to know Satan doesn't want you to see that. He'll do everything he can to blind you to who God is, who Jesus is, and what his will is for your life. And although that passage is uniquely and specifically for people who do not know Christ, it is the same principle that Satan uses to blind believers who refuse to deepen their walk and their life with Christ. Satan comes in and deceives you as well. And you stay locked in this little realm of, 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 of immaturity in your walk in life. So that Satan blinds you. The word there says that when he's blinded, that's the word to flu. If you ever were in, in, in the military, you studied military strategy, it's the concept to flu is of putting up a smoke screen or using some deceptive maneuver that makes people think one thing when the truth is something else. They don't know where the real value is. They don't know where the real thing is. And so this, this, this is the idea. Satan, Satan lays down this obscure, opaque, kind of blinding, smoky screen before you. And you really don't see what's going on. You get my little glimpse here and there, but you've been bluffed. You've been deceived. That'll deceive you. The fourth thing that deceives us in our spiritual blind, in life is, is spiritual laziness. This kind of plays into one. All right. We're just getting preoccupied with just being religiously busy, but this is, this is really about the person who gets preoccupied really just with himself when he says that uh, Peter's speaking to the church and he mentions about seven principles of Christian growth. He talks about add to your faith virtue and add to that, you know, the discernment. And he talks about all these elements of discipline and commitment and faithfulness to add to your faith. He said, if you, if you don't discipline this, this way, this kind of reads, if, but if you lack these things, if you choose not to be mature, if you choose not to have disciplines in your spiritual life, then you become blind and you can't see it far off and you have forgotten that your sin was purged. You've forgotten what the Lord has done. You've forgotten the power of the cross. You've forgotten the blood of Jesus Christ. See, lots of Christians do this. They get on fire for the Lord. They go just a little short way and then they begin to drift. You know, then they begin to move out. They haven't understood the principle that this is a faith life. This is a faith walk. You don't walk it by your feelings. All right. So you, you step out of your feelings. You start moving with Jesus. But if you do not move with the Lord, you're bound right there. And now you begin to forget about Jesus, about your walk with God, your commitment to Christ. And he, he simply says, you're just blind. It's two believers. You're just blind. Your spiritual Slothfulness, your spiritual laziness to say, I, I don't want to read the Bible. I don't want to spend time with prayer. I don't want, uh, what happens is you just open the door for the enemy to come in, blind you to what God's up to and what God wants to do in your life. And then you get to this place when things happen in your life and crisis comes in your life and problems come in your life. You know, you, you don't see with the right kind of vision. You see things, but you're looking at all the wrong things and you're making decisions based upon the, what you're seeing instead of what God wants to show you. And when you make decisions based on just what you can see physically without taking time to hear from God, then you start making bad decisions. One of the greatest evidences that you're doing that is, it's found in the simple truth that spiritual blindness always brings about murmuring, whining, complaining. Oh God, why did you do this to me? Oh, why is this happening to me? I can't believe God, you know, love me. God, if you really love me, then this wouldn't be happening to me. Where'd you get that theology? You know, I like my children think because I gave them a spanking that I didn't love them. The Bible says just the opposite. Because I love them, I gave them a spanking. Amen. Amen. I spanked Joseph when he didn't need it because I knew he was going to do something by my back. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
what happened? We, we murmur. We, we complain. I mean, how, how much of what comes out of our mouth is really praise and adoration or worship or, or just the promises of God? We walk around, oh, I'm sunk, I'm doomed, there's no use, there's no hope, this won't work, there's no way out. It's what I get for following God. Why do I ever do? You know? If that's where you're at, it's a, it's a little bit of a glimpse into your reality. You know, that this desperation you have, uh, it, 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 it's, it's just going to get worse because you won't, you won't move to reality. Now, here's the good part about this whole story is this guy's hour of desperation. We're sunk, we're doomed, we're going to die. It was also his hour of greatest revelation. And when you start getting a little revelation, it always leads to revival. We get, a little, we get a little unctionized when we start really seeing what God wants to do in our life. It should motivate us and spur us to get a little more excited about what God's up to in our life. And so Elisha, here's what he says, first of all. And it's, it, here's the simple prayer. And I don't know the attitude that Elisha prayed with it. But it might have been, oh, Lord, open his eyes. I don't know. Or he took it as an opportunity. Lord, this is the time now that this guy can grow some. Open his eyes. And when the Lord opened his eyes, he saw that the mountains round the city, which were bigger than the city, were filled, all right, with angels and chariots of fire. Now, take that just into account for a moment to show you, if we've got a little army marching around the city, you've got big mountains around that. And the big mountains are filled, so you know now that they that are far, so what the, the enemy, the, the guy finally says, they that are far us are more than they that are against us. Well, obviously. You know, and he's excited and he's, he's rejoicing and, and he's shouting because now he sees things differently. Now, again, I don't know if even Elijah saw those things. I think Elijah's obviously saying, I know what the Bible says, and the Bible says that God is for me, God's not against me. God says that he'll protect me. God says that he's my stronghold. God says that he's my fortress. And I know that God is sovereign, so he's bigger than any enemy I could possibly have. I know he's omnipotent. That means there's no bigger power than God. I know he's omniscient, so nobody knows more than God. I, you know, I, I, just, I just know he's omnipresent, so nobody can be everywhere like God is, so God's everywhere. So his theology, which was, which was, which was solid, birthed a faith in his heart, which he would stand and live on. But obviously the Lord gives this picture of, of eyes being opened and he sees things. Now, whether you see the exact angelic spirits or not, you're still going to see some things. You say, well, what am I going to see when my eyes are spiritually open? Three elements here I think are important. One is that we're going to see when our eyes truly get open, something's going to be really obvious, something's going to be evident. And what's going to be evident is our conquest. That we are the victors here. We don't have to sweat the enemy's efforts. Romans 8, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who's against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered up for, up for us all, how will he not also with his son freely give us all things? The context of this verse, two verses here. Prior to it are several verses filled with woe, calamity, chaos, spiritual warfare, principalities, powers, sickness, death. There's this long list that comes out. And Paul says, oh my, that's a big bad list of all the terrible things that can befall us. What do we say about that? I'll tell you what we say about it. God's for us who's against us. Doesn't matter who's against us. God's for me. Bring it on. I mean, that's what he's saying and here's the premise. He had, he had an understanding of the Word of God. The simplest scripture that we know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. All right, that's a pretty simple principle. If I know that, if I realize that, and if I'll just dwell on that, I realize that God loved me enough to give his Son. God loved me enough to give his only begotten Son. God loved me that much. If God loves me that much, do you think he's going to save me and then abandon me? I mean, he gave the most expensive, extravagant gift that could be given. If he did that, it's what Paul's saying, will he not take care of the rest of your life? Is he going to leave you midstream? Is he going to abandon you? Is he going to be unfaithful to you? Paul said, even when I have been unfaithful, he's been faithful. Even when I haven't towed the line, he has. And he's been faithful through it all. So we need to, I think when our eyes get open, we're going to see well clearly that, hey, I'm the victor here. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I, I'm the overcomer here. 
I'm going to see that Jesus is Lord. I'm going to see that the devil's defeated and that his, 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 his time is done. I'm going to see that Jesus, the conquest belongs to him, that God raised up Jesus. He conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave. He conquered Satan. If he conquered all those things, what am I wringing my hands over? I may not understand how this is going to turn out. I may not and most likely will not understand the principles and the processes and every step of it all. But as I walk with God, as I keep my eyes open with God, I'm going to know that, hey, simple truth is greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Greater is he that's in me. You know, that verse starts in 1 John 4. Most people just quote that part of it. Here's the first of it. <clears throat> you are from God, little children. Amen. You've been born of God, little children. You belong to God, little children is what he's saying. You're God's kid. And God is your father. And because he's your father and you're his child, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen. Greater is he. Go ahead and praise the Lord. That's worth praising God. <clears throat> when God's old brother Joe, the devil's after me. I think the Bill Stafford response to that was appropriate. He said, you ain't got enough of the Holy Ghost working in you to get the devil's attention. <laughs> it's not the devil that's after you. You're just caving into your own flesh, your own sin. But the reality of it all is I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. I'm in God. God's in me. What more do we need in life? If God before us, who can be against us? It, that, that's the truth. The matter of fact is clear. I belong to God. God doesn't lose. God already counted it all lost at the cross and then came out of the cross and won the victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. Because of the cross, all things work together for good to them that love God are the called according to his purpose. That's what we see when our eyes get open. Not this, oh man, it just, it's, you know, I just, I just can't, you know. Hey, you get your eyes open, it'll begin to regulate your life and your attitude in so many different ways. You'll be sitting in five o'clock traffic. When you get, just take a moment to get your eyes open, you'll quit whining and you'll start praising the Lord. You can be sitting in the sick room at the hospital and still be praising the Lord. When your eyes get open, the second thing you see when your eyes get open, and this goes part with one, is your company. You are in Christ. You are of God, little children. You belong to Jesus. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. We start at this point. That was author Paint, great theologian, hundreds of years ago wrote this verse. Said, we need to learn to practice the presence of God. This is what we're talking about here. They that be with us. They are, they, God is with us now. He has assigned his angels charge over us right now. Right now, the Lord is present in your life. Right, even though you may not acknowledge it, he's still there. He's still, he's still obvious. And when we begin to realize his company and his presence in our life, I bet you a thousand to one, your attitude changes and even your actions change. All right? They'll change. And you've heard me use illustration before. Driving, get on one of the local freeways, start driving fast as you want to drive. And the first cop you see, I guarantee you, you're going to hit your brakes. You're going to make sure your seat belt's fastened. You're probably going to wonder where the insurance card is and if your registration's up to date. All in one fell swoop. Everything changes. We start recognizing God's presence. Man, it starts changing our heart and changing our life. Having problems at home? Start recognizing the presence of God. When you, say, you start recognizing the presence of God, you won't speak to your wife that way with Jesus in the room. He's in the room already. You won't speak to your husband that way. Amen? Well, I'm, uh, he belongs to Jesus and Jesus is here. I think I better use a little more respect here. This person belongs to Christ. Our company is the presence of God himself. I love this passage in Psalms when it says, as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so is the Lord about his people from henceforth and forevermore. I know I shared this when we were talking about prophecy one time, coming back from Israel, but it's such a good illustration. I'm just, you just have to hear it one more time. Somebody hadn't heard it. Coming back from Israel, one of the many trips the Lord let us go on, lead groups on. We've been over there about two weeks and we're coming back from the, on the plane and I was so tired, you know. One thing, I get to go to Israel and, lead and do those groups, but I was always leading the groups. So that, that, that was work. And I, I told Kathy, I'm going to pass out, you know. And then there was a guy sitting around, I think I know probably the Lord wants me to witness him, but Lord, can I get a nap first, you know, kind of thing. And I'll talk to him later, you know. So <clears throat> I just peel off to sleep. Well, you know, Kathy strikes up a conversation with Stranger over here, and he's doing some work on stuff. Well, Stranger over here on our right 
is really a very well-known biblical archaeologist. In fact, I'd used his materials and read his materials and prophecy studies. In fact, some people believe that he was the, he was the, the person who they came up uh, when, in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, that he was the person that they came up with, that they took the idea for that character from this individual Bible archaeologist. His name was Vindel Jones. You heard of Indiana Jones. Well, this was Vindel Jones. And... Uh, so Vindel was a bibliologist, did lots of digs all over the Middle East and stuff, and looking for all the different things that, you know, they were looking for in the Lost Ark. <clears throat> but anyway, Kathy gets over here, and she starts talking to Vindel, and, and he starts sharing with her some things. And he said, I just got back, led a big study group over to Israel. And he said, let me tell you something we worked on. He said, we, we had to, a map guy, a topographist, make us these maps with molds, like plastic molds. And he said, we'd hand them out. So they had little dimensions to them and things like that. So and it was all dimensionally correct. He said, so these, these are really neat. He said, and he said we've, the guy made we just plastic overlays that they pour on the mold and flip it off. He said, then they'd be painted and you know, all the stuff. That, this is a mountain here. He said, this is the most interesting one. He said, this is Jerusalem and all the mountains round about it. The square is about like this and had little mountains and everything. He said, do something. He said, this was the most amazing thing. He said, when I was looking at this, he said, and I finally got the molds back from the artist and everything that they had commissioned to do all this work. He said, uh, I put my hand under the mold because it was, you know, the, all the hollow parts were there. And he said, this passage in Psalms 125 came to my mind as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so is the Lord around his people from henceforth and more. He said, when you put your hand under this mold, it's about the size of your hand, all the mountains fit perfectly in the palm of your hands here. So where the high peaks are on your hand, that's where the mountains were. Where the low places were, that's where the low places were on the map. He says... Isn't it amazing that Lord even built Jerusalem to be a message to his people that he is always around them and surrounding them and is their stronghold and is their strength and is their power. And I slept through all that and missed every bit of it. <laughs> Beautiful part is, that, hey, the Lord is about us. This is not fairy tales. This is not religious, you know, fakery. This is the reality that God loved us enough to send Jesus to die for us and he is present in our life. He has conquered on our behalf and not only has he conquered on our behalf, he has brought us into his family. We are in fellowship with him and the battle is won because the Lord has declared it won. He's our victor. But also one thing that becomes, and this is I think probably the most important part of this to make it a reality in your life is our confession. You miss this, you know, you're, you're going to miss it. If you read the passage, it says that when the prophet told the servant, told the Lord, asked the Lord to pray, and prayed and asked the Lord to open the servant's eyes, that the servant opened his eyes and he made a declaration, they that are for us are more than they that be against us. So what's the point here? It's our confession. The Bible tells us that we believe with our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's how you got saved. What if I just believe my heart and never confess it, never claim it, never stand it? Then it's not faith, is it? It's just dead works. But when I stepped out one day and chose to believe what God said and said, hey, I trust you, Jesus. You're my Lord and you're my Savior. That confession of faith, that's such an important part. There's the word of faith where God speaks to our heart. There's a work of faith where I choose to follow what he told me. But then there's that word of faith where I say in agreement with what God said. Not me just saying anything. I'm saying what God said. God said the victory is mine. God said all things work together. So that means I can look at the worst of my scenarios and say, this is good, no matter how bad it might look. Because it is what it is. And what it is is good. Oh, it's bad. No, it's good. Brother Joe, it is what it is. Well, it is to you what it is, but it is to me what God said it was, and God said it was good. Why? Because all things work together for good. So I can praise the Lord. So I can shout. So I can, like the servant here at Dothan, raise his voice and say, hey, praise God. We're going to win this thing. Because God's shown me that they that are for us are more than they be against us. You know, sometimes the only thing you can do is just praise the Lord. But what greater evidence, just as murmuring as an evidence of our unbelief, and faith becomes the token evidence of our faith, our belief, our confession does. We say, I believe, I believe, I trust, I sing, I praise, I rejoice. That's the evidence. I really do believe what God said. Now, if I just choose to live, ignore what God says, do whatever I want, that's no proof in my life at all. Faith without works is dead. The truth is, if I begin to hold to the truth of the word of God, I will speak it. I'll say it. I'll confess it. I, you know, it's like Jehoshaphat. Remember the story of Jehoshaphat when they're surrounded? 
This is one, I, I, I was going to do one whole sermon on it, but it ties into this one, so I'll skip that one. But Jehoshaphat the, the, is in a walled city, safe and secure until all the kings of the enemies decide to come together and fight against the children of Israel in this one city where the king is. They surround the city on every side. They're outnumbered, they're outmanned, they're out more military equipment than they can handle. I mean, everything that needs to be done to win this battle against King Jehoshaphat and his people has been set in place by the enemy. And so one of the military strategists comes in and says, we're sunk, <laughs> we're doomed, we're dead. We're surrounded on every side. They have everything they need to conquer us. We're, it's over for us, it's a done deal. To which Jehoshaphat, catch this, here's the king. He stands up, he's got this big priestly kingly robe on and he rips it open. Falls on his face, declares a fast and he says to the Lord, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. He humbles himself. He's looking at, against all odds. There's no way to win this war. How are we going to win this war? I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you. And sometimes that's the only place we can come, isn't it? I'm going to praise you. I'm going to look to you. I'm going to believe you. I don't know what to do. But here's the best part of the story. The Lord says, get all the musicians and priests together. Get the army together. We're going to have a concert. We're going to kill every one of them. <laughs> and he calls them all together. And he says, thus saith the Lord. And he speaks to them. Here's the word, here's the word from the passage. He appointed singers of the Lord that they should praise the beauty of holiness. And they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy and dearest forever. And the passage goes on. But basically, here's what happens. They open the gates, which is mistake number one. You never do that when the enemy's surrounding you. Unless you realize you're the winner, right? You, you can advance. You don't run the other direction. You don't stick your head in the sand. You don't do the Jonah move. You move forward. And the singers go out first and they begin to sing about the beauty of holiness and the beauty of the Lord. And they begin just to worship God. Can you imagine the, the mindset of those warriors on the enemy lines there? What they're thinking, these guys are nuts. What's going on here? And then one guy says, oh, maybe there's not nuts. Maybe there's something we don't see going on here. <laughs> and then the Bible says that God as they began to worship God and the armies of God came out, that God set in confusion among the ranks of the enemy. And there was a great victory that day against all odds. Hey, why don't you throw the gates open and just walk out and start praising God? Why don't you throw the gates out and quit worrying about what people might think if you say praise the Lord? Why don't you throw the gate wide open and humble yourself, tear your own garments of pride that says, I'm always concerned about what everybody's going to think about me. Say, don't worry about what people think about you. Just say, I'm a believer. That's who I am. It's not what I do, it's who I am. And I'm going to believe because I'm a believer. That's what believers do. We believe. And if we believe, then we move forward. If we believe, we praise the Lord. If we believe, we shout. If we believe, we sing. There's a confession. If all that comes out of my mouth is whining and murmuring, complaining, there's no faith evident there. There's no faith obvious there. What happens when I step out and begin to praise the Lord? What happens in those moments? Well, Brother Joe, they might hear me. <laughs> That's a, we want the enemy to hear us. Oh, we're done for. I don't feel like singing. I don't sing very good. Sing. Sing, sing, sing. Listen, wouldn't you rather just, you know, I mean, would you rather die down in the valley moaning and pouting about everything? You know? And if I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down singing, all right? <laughs> but here's what happens. I usually don't go down singing. I usually go up singing. I usually go to victory singing. I usually, if I'll just have that confession in my mouth of God's grace, of his word, repeating his promises, confessing his truth, that's when victory comes in my life. But if I am mum, if I am closed lips, not praise is not coming out, I have nothing to show or nothing to offer. It's like Paul when he came to the church of Galatians. He says, where's this blessedness you speak of? They had this great testimony that God's doing something, and then they'd all gotten turned in against each other and fight one another and messing with each other, and there was all kinds of divisions, and people were reverting back to just kind of a works kind of mentality for Christianity. They'd lost the joy of the Lord. There was no blessedness to speak of. I know there's always one person in the room when I preach on something like this. That's just wonderful, Pastor, but you don't understand my predicament. It 
it is what it is. No, it isn't. What does God say it is? God says, there may be tribulation, there may be sickness, there may be sorrow, there may be temptation, there may be trials, there may even be failure. But I can guarantee you as my child, everything going on in your life, I'm going to make work together for good. Because you love God and you've been called according to my purpose. You're not here for you. You're here for the kingdom. And I'm going to get you through this deal. Amen. And I'm going to walk you through it. I'm going to get your family through it. I'm going to get your kids through it. I'm going to get you through it. It may not be in the time you like, but it'll get done. Because I'm God and I'm in charge. So I'll start praising the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, help us to be honest with our own selves. I know you've given us this barometer that we can check today. It's called what we say and it's the confessions of our mouth. God, help us to see today if the confessions of our mouth have been negative and, Father, are arrogant and, Lord, just filled with unbelief. God, let us show, reveal to us that that's where our heart's at. So change our hearts today, Father. We, we give ourselves to you. We make ourselves available to you. Lord, this sermon today reminds us of the necessity to keep humble before you. And to stay in tune with you and your will. Open our eyes. As, like in Laodicea, you said to anoint your eyes with salve. God, let the Holy Spirit open our eyes of understanding. Help us not just be living for ourselves and what we want. Help us to understand the big picture here of eternity. Not just this temporal world.